<laughs> yeah, share my screen. Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is Depicting Oneself Beyond Gender and Identity. I'm Al Miner. I'm the founding director and chief curator of the art galleries at Georgetown University and also an associate professor of art history and exam studies there. I'm like, excited to welcome our five artist panelists and all of you to hear a conversation tonight about an important topic. You should be seeing my screen. It's been 60 years since Betty Friedan wrote The Feminine Mystique and we started conversations again about gender and equality. It's been 30 years since the culture wars of the 1990s, but scrutiny under certain artists who were exploring their identities through their work. It's been four and a half years since Alyssa Milano used the hashtag Me Too. And tonight and around the world, people are speaking about gender and identity in a new and expansive way around their dining room tables while watching Netflix and doing things like we are doing right now today, having a conversation. I'd like to share with you the names and a little bit about our panelists before we jump into some questions about them. Joining us tonight is Geraldine Montano, visual artist from San Francisco, California. Artist Lale Meron from Denver, Colorado. Jackson Lin, who splits her time between Brooklyn and Berlin, but is a night reporting from Germany. Lulu Stanley, also in the Bay Area of California. And art professor and painter Susanna Coffey from New York City. I'm going to stop sharing and jump us now into our conversation with our speakers. Hi, Geraldine, you're up first tonight. Thank you Hello. for joining us. Welcome. Um, so I'd like you to lead the charge a bit, sharing with us about your background and how it impacts your work. You are of Navajo or Diné descent and have spoken about how gender dynamics and gender politics within that particular Native American community have impacted you. And I'd love you to jump us off by talking a little bit about how that and particularly the depiction of the gendered body in your work serves to Tell us about your identity or the identity of your community through art. Okay, thank you for having me. Uh, gender dynamics in native culture is definitely an inspiration to me. And I have had to educate myself on native cultures due to colonialism's erasure of native culture. And it actually with my parents assimilated and lacking information on their culture too. They were like mainstream Americans and that's how they raised me and my siblings. Um, my interest in featuring the female gender in my work, I can attribute to a few factors, historical and some personal. Uh, first, I came of age in the late 70s during the second wave of feminism. And this exposure gave me insight into the oppressive patriarchy and women's struggle for equality, respect, and safety. Plus, uh, I witnessed my father behaving in sexist, derogatory ways towards my mother and myself, my sisters. Traditionally, Native cultures were matriarchal in contrast with patriarchal heteronormative and binary systems which create hierarchies to subjugate women and other genders sorry i think i <laughs> mixed up my notes uh, um did i mention why i thought my father was behaving in sexist ways. I think I did. Yeah. No, you didn't. Okay, well, I might repeat myself. But <laughs> I better hurry up, I'm running out of time. Okay, uh, so I attribute my father's behavior to colonialism and the fact that it destroyed many native cultures, assimilating them into European culture, which included patriarchal ideology 
And this was or and is an oppressive social system allowing men to dominate other women and gain social privilege. Before colonialism, the majority of Native American and Aboriginal cultures were functioning as matriarchal societies, which were egalitarian. They valued social equality of both genders, male and female. And the gender dynamics in Native culture being quite different. Uh, specifically, the Diné Navajo saw people as having four different genders and the culture allowed for a lot of gender fluidity. They accepted and honored the feminine man, the masculine woman and other non-binary genders. And that said, I feel I need to point out that in the description of this panel talk, one of the topics was non-binary and no one on this panel is non-binary. Um, I think if we are aiming for diversity and inclusion, representation is extremely important. I myself actually have a grandchild who's a teenager who just came out is a trans boy. And I ran this topic by them. And they, they also like art. So we were talking about art and the topic of the panel. And they asked me, are there any like trans or non-binary people on the panel? And I said, no, I believe not. And they were a little upset over it to say the least. Um, but I've been, lately my work, I've been experimenting with, instead of depicting like women's bodies, I also am playing around with the idea of androgynous bodies, but I'm not genderqueer or non-binary, so I, I, I think I need to think more about what I'm working on with the artwork images in order to be respectful, but I'm definitely an ally of gender, queer, and non-binary people. So, um, also in my work, as you see here, I did mention the fact that women we're fighting for equality, but I also think safety. We have to struggle for safety. Uh, just like somebody mentioned about the Me Too movement. And well, this series was about sex trafficking, speaking of safety. So I read about trafficking and then I found it was happening on Native American reservations. And it's very underreported, just as the missing and murdered indigenous women. But another factor of, of why I depict women is to honor them and bring to light marginalized people. And does that say that? I think that does it. I'm going to move on to our clicker. Thanks, Gerald. And we'll wrap back to some of those issues. I think you touched on really important ones. Lolly, do you feel personal pressure to make work that really reveals something about who you are to a wider audience that makes something private, public? And as someone, again, another panelist with an intersectional identity, what does that mean for you in this current political moment? What are the pros and cons and the complexities of sharing who you are through your artwork? Uh, thank you for that um, really complex question. I'm going to share my screen now or attempt to. Uh, I'm going to uh, start by saying thank you to Horasis for the invitation and for Al for all the moderation and organizing uh, efforts that has taken to get us here. And uh, thank everyone uh, who's out there who's joining us. 
My artwork comes from a very personal place with big complex uh, problems that many people can uh, relate to. My parents are scientists and I was uh, with my family driven from my home country, birth country of Iran due to a revolution and a theocratic government change. Uh, given our time constraints, I'm going to focus on one project that encompasses many of my ideologies and artistic methodologies as well. Through my artwork, I strive to create circumstances, situations, environments, and landscapes that inspire or incite critical questions that ideally lead to empathy and change. So the project is called Men of God, Men of Nature, um, which was uh, implemented at the Denver Art Museum, um, which is an incredible space uh, by the architect Daniel Liebeskind. And as you can see from the exterior of the building, there are no right angles, and that is uh, also mirrored on the inside in the galleries. The artwork I'm about to show you um, has many influences, both from the East and the West. Uh, the West influences include Donald Judd's uh, Perfect Cubes, and as well as... Um, uh, Stanley Kubrick 2001 Space Odyssey with the obelisk. Um, and the Middle Eastern influences, um, very much from uh, a, a Middle Eastern roots, um, is the Kaaba um, in Saudi Arabia, the House of God. Um, and the work I do often is influenced by um, monotheistic religions. Uh, I'm showing you a interior kind of sneak peek uh, for scale. So, um, as, as I go through this uh, video, I will walk you through it. So basically creating a piece inside the Daniel Liebskind architecture really inspired me to think about it as an environment, um, a, a, a warped environment that I would say is, is um, what we live in. And so for that, I wanted to make a perfect cube, which represents uh, um, ideologies that uh, are often skewed due to um, political agendas. This cube um, on the exterior has 176 linear, linear meters of topography, um, and the inside is uh, skinned also um, with this lattice work uh, that you see, about 123 uh, linear meters of that. Um, as one enters the space, it is an interactive piece. Um, these nine related monitors have these orbs, and they just basically approach you. They they want to um, to greet you, and uh, they can be um, rather uh, um, kind of uh, animated. Uh, they have uh, various uh, characters, everything from aggressive to passive to uh, chaotic. And in this space, um, what's really important uh, for me is that you have a embodied experience. I try to create spaces where you kind of uh, start to, to be part of it and to, in some ways, uh, experience what it might be to be in somebody else's um, position. And so in this space, things start to reveal themselves quite slowly. Um, you can see uh, different patterns. Um, you can see uh, reflections. Uh, the entire inside is clad with mirror. And so you are literally part of the piece. You cannot escape this environment. Um, you can uh, pretend that you are uh, not interested in politics or don't take part in it, but um, uh, you, you are are actually part of it in, in, in an active way, regardless of your um, willing participation. And so in this space, as these uh, uh, um, uh, orbs are, are surrounding you, you also then start to see yourself mirrored in the space, both literally uh, and symbolically. Um, and as you exit the space, uh, the the surface of the entire um, cube is also highly reflective. And so you also see yourself in that specific typography or excuse me, topography. Um, and so you're part of the inside and the outside, the inside being extremely um, different um, in its scale. And um, as you walk out, you um, see me in there for scale, um, but also to understand uh, what it means to be part of this um, to this space and understand the scope of it as these orbs are also visually connected to the inside. Um, I think uh, be, being with my background and creating work that really does 
um, try to bring someone um, who is not of the same background into a space to have that dialogue is scary and even dangerous to unveil so much of oneself in a hostile political climate. But I deeply believe that it's essential to make critical art to connect with other people to build empathy. Thank you, Lolly. That was great. Jachan, I want to turn to you in Berlin. Thank you for joining us at this late hour. Um, it's an easy segue from Lolly about how we're living in dangerous times. Certainly in recent news, we are very aware of that fact. Um, though you were in Berlin now, you split your time um, with New York and the United States, and this has been a very difficult time for many Asian Americans and Asian mm -hmm. Americans. As a first-generation Asian American woman, does your work contribute to the political dialogue going along around those issues? If it does, how, how does that play out for you as a maker of art? Well, thank you for the question and thank you for having me. Um, so, uh, yeah, indeed, as an Asian woman, uh, I do feel it's important to speak out um, for ourselves at this critical moment. Um, as an Asian, as a woman, and also as an American. Yet, um, in my work in general, it's about, uh, it's mostly about human conditions, like from day to day life and uh, under certain social and cultural circumstances. So, um, for some of my recent work, especially since the pandemic started, um, I do create some work and, and um, people read it as a, a political statement. Um, but usually at the moment when I create my work, uh, I don't really have the intention to make our work, you know, in order to fit into the political, political dialogue. Uh, I'm always trying to be as close as possible to my feelings and the, um, the reflection based on the experience and the information I've been researched. Um, I, I would like to share one of my pieces. Um, I could try to see if I could share my screen. So um, in these in these sculptures, um, take, so take these sculptures example. Um, as it says in the title of the work, the title of this work is called "An Acid Attack in Front of Her Own Residence." I use this artwork to describe an attack on an Asian woman in Brooklyn in April of 2020. It was not too long after the COVID-19 started in the U.S. Um, so I saw the news um, and then I found out more of the information from YouTube where it shows the complete footage from the neighborhood security camera. So the incident happened uh, around 9 p.m. in Brooklyn so um, this Asian woman just went out uh, to her front door to throw away the trash. And there was already a, a guy, a male, uh, waiting in front of her apartment. He immediately pulled a bucket of acid, uh, acid um, on her neck and back and just flew away. And the woman was trying to crawl back to her own stairs. It was so, um, I was so struck that um, this incident happened just about 15 minutes away from my apartment in Brooklyn. And that, and that, uh, and that woman is also the same age as me. Um, at the moment, the, uh, the silent footage turned into a horror movie in, a, in our reality. So uh, I then tried to use the sculpture um, to capture and imagine the moment of her pain when she uh, tumbled on the stairs and crawling back to her apartment. Uh, as you can see in the picture, the food was cast into bloody color and, and deformed shape is some kind of root like tissue uh, explored on the hill. The sculpture um, lies on the tilted base that symbolized the, a blank tombstone um, half buried in the ground. So in general, I'm using my work to capture the physical and um, psychological suffering that victim 
had to bear like at that moment, but also like throughout the rest of her life due to um due to this hate crime incident. So um this piece not just describe an unfortunate incident, but also also um it, it depicts our fear as an Asian woman of being a target during this anti-Asian sentiment. Um, so in general, I'm not, um, I could stop sharing. So in general, I'm not, so in general, I'm not so political about my work, but uh, I do use my work as an instrument to transform the, uh, the abstract experience in our life into, um, into the, the artwork, which could be represented again and again uh, later on in the future. <clears throat> My time to stop. Sorry, guys. Um, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And Lulu, you are probably going to be our last official question before we go to a more open format. Um, and my question for you goes back to a little bit of my introduction. You were vital as an activist and an artist during that second wave of feminism and the women's movement. And very much in San Francisco, you still reside. You talked to me at one point about how you developed your own artistic style in opposition to what was being made by cisgender white straight men in the art world who are working in a very different visual language than you are. How do you think your work, which is still in a figurative vein and a classical vein, fits into the conversations that are happening now? How did you get to that place? Well, <clears throat> I always felt if I was saying it, they couldn't get me. And if and uh, early on, uh, when I was uh, in graduate school, I got together with three women and we would go into the graveyard and get stoned and paint. And we decided we were going to break all the rules of the art world at the day in the day and rebel. And uh, at the time, it was abstract expressionism, where if you wanted to be famous, you couldn't use color, you couldn't tell a story, it couldn't be personal, had to be big, uh, couldn't be you couldn't use humor. And we decided the only way to re rebel was to do uh, to opposite that. So we did these little tiny watercolors uh, talking about our life at lives. And then shortly after that, this was the late sixties, I joined a consciousness raising group and got heavily into the women's movement. And I think the women's movement for me allowed me, gave me permission to talk about my own life on my own terms. And so I've always felt um, it freed me up. I Some people think that I'm brave because I talk about my life, but um, I found a way to juxtapose the current political scene or uh, the quotidian of everyday life with the classical motifs of art history and uh, Greco-Roman mythology. And um, I led tours to Italy for years, took artists to Italy, and I never saw my paintings on those walls. I decided I would, I would paint, often um, people refer to my work as I, I paint classical paintings with an American accent. But the painting behind me is the Triumph of Flora. It's still in, it's in progress. But I'm riffing on the collection of the Legion of Honor in San Francisco. I'm doing a, a sketchbook based on the De Young Museum and the San Francisco and uh, the Legion of Honor. And then I've been taking paintings from their collection and flipping them. So this is a San Francisco version of the realm of Flora, and it's the Gay Freedom Day Parade, and the model is our trans woman uh, model. I taught, I teach uh, life drawing at uh, Berkeley City College. And so I've I'm kind of, the De Young Museum is in the background, and the 
Golden Gate Bridge is there, and painting a frame around it uh, almost makes the painting a, an object. It's not really a painting about, it's I'm making an object in the sort of riffing on this Tiepolo painting. But uh, as far as gender politics, um, I'm all, I, the woman is always the protagonist in my paintings. And um, so I, I go first from my experience and what I'm going through in my life. And then I'll, I'll find a way to juxtapose a classical motif. And it's, it's in a way, it's a way of camouflaging the personal aspects. And humor is always a part of my work. It's, it's the, it's the one thing I can count on. I don't, I don't want to mess with it. It's, it, it comes up from under the surface. And I think it's a way to draw people in. And then I hit them on the, I hit them once they're in. But uh, when I was a, a student, I always wanted to do paintings people would gag and cry in front of and be moved by. And um, one of my first shows, uh, I walked by and there were two women howling in laughter, guffawing in front of my painting. And I thought, well, I can, that's, that's as good as crying. <laughs> so uh, I don't know how much time I have left, but. <laughs> we were supposed to be joined tonight by one other artist in a coffee who unfortunately has been trying to log in and has been unsuccessful. But I think what I'd like to do now is Actually, ask my question for Susanna to all of you, because some of you have already hit upon this, and Lulu, you've made us a really easy segue. Um, Susanna's a longtime professor. I was going to ask her about what working with younger people, whether it be as a professor, as a grandparent, Geraldine mentioned, as a mentor, you know, Judge, you're in an artist residency center with people of different generations. How has seeing the work of younger artists, emerging artists, mentoring young artists, knowing younger people, changed your own understanding of your identity or what identity means to artists now? Anyone just jump in? Or I'll I'll jump in. I, I taught for years and I, I teach at Berkeley City College and I found um, that Teaching is my way of giving back, in a sense. And um, I, I, I used to get students that were really troubled, that were often, uh, they'd take me aside and say they're, they're changing identities, sexual identities. And I often had, gave them assignments to draw it in your sketchbook. You have a, a, a forum to to work out your changes and um, I, I don't know, it seemed to, seemed to me, I, got, I was able to get into more personal parts of their lives through the, the action of making art and teaching. I don't know if that. Lily, you're a professor. What have your interactions been like with students and their identities and how they express them through art? Um, I think it's it's been an incredible journey. Um, I've been uh, teaching for twenty years, and to um, to see how how uh, you know the different generations have become really uh, empowered and taking on that voice and having um, both creative expression, but also um, being politically active in it, and and also being allies. I think that they're so uh, incredible and comfortable with being allies to their peers. Um, and I think in ways that, uh, you know, it, it, it's, I feel like we've kind of skipped some generations in there of, mm -hmm. of that allyship um, and it's back again. And so um, they just, they make really powerful work, really um, aware of things that are going on. I've got students I'm worried about that um, are getting very little sleep with the current uh, kind of Russia mm -hmm. Ukraine situation um, because they're, they're just, they're really, um, worried about it and, and understanding it as young adults in, in a different way. And I think it's one of the first wars that, that they, um, as folks who have, you know, basically turned officially 18 plus are, are part of. Um, and so 
yeah, it, it's. I think it's it's really important. I think it's they understand the complexities of of what it means when we have a particular states uh, in the in the U.S. who make um, really uh, de big decisions for personal. Um, uh, you know, I, I would say health. Um, like Texas just made one, um, uh, and uh, or another one, and so yeah, I've got I've got students who are. Um, quite upset about it and trying to understand what they can actually do um, through the creative process to to both support um, anyone who is a young trans in Texas, but also to kind of uh, make sure that these changes um, don't change uh, the ways that we treat each other as human beings. And you mentioned your work as being instrument of change at one point in the way you described your own practice. Do you all believe you can take it, anyone can take it? Especially I think there is an idealism to youth, right? So now for those of us who have kids, grandkids, work with students, that I hope that their generation sort of excitement about making change through work continues. But do, you, do we all believe that it's possible that the world that they enter into as artists can see artwork be a vehicle for actual policy change or change that will hit people's real lives. How does that happen? That was a very small question in our final, you know, 10 minutes, but would anyone like to talk about that jump from inspiring change to actually making change through art? Particularly what relates you know, to Art really inspires change, but it happens slowly and it's kind of, unfortunate and scary that once we live in there's so many extremes uh, like my grandchild is very bold their friends are very bold coming out about who they are and they'll talk about it to anybody but then we have the backlash of the opposite conservative people and Women's right to choose is being eliminated in a few states. So I, I'm hoping that the boldness of the youth does change a lot that's going on now. But, um, does it matter that you post something I'm always talking to younger folks about, and I think everyone thinks about all the time now is, does it matter that you finish a new artwork interview and instantly put it on Instagram? Does it matter that you're sharing your created pieces, especially between shows or between exhibition opportunities with the world digitally in terms of making those changes occur faster? <laughs> I love Instagram. <laughs> I finish a painting or do a drawing, usually I'm referring to something in the New York Times and I put it up and the next day I get, you know, comments about it. So I, I like it. It's a it's a way of of feeling a community when you're stuck in your studio for two years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, and I, I think it's very, it's a lot of fun. It's just, it's play for artists. <laughs> I have a me. I have a love hate relationship with social media. <laughs> so and I think I'm getting burned out on it now with things going on in the world, things going on in the world, and the way youth are harassed online. I just have mixed feelings. I feel um, because my generation is sort of between the digital and analog, so. I do find a gap. I'm like between the gap. So I do like trying to catch up the digital world. Um, but at the same time, I'm very, um, I'm still very attached to like tangible things like materials, like objects and, and installation. Um, like um, right right now, I'm actually collaborating with a new, uh, it's not a new, I mean a young artist, like she's like 25 years old. And so I feel like um, for the collaboration, I do feel I learned a lot as well. Um, but at the same time, uh, I also have um, 
Like I, I also like have to try to understand they like, are actually in a sort of different world um, because um, everything is so digitalized or virtualized. So um, they and also they also kind of affect their concept of how they perceive the 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 actual um, the actual world around like the reality around them. And then um, in a way that also transfer their experience onto the social media, for example. Um, so, so things that they are seeing, I feel it's a different, different pers perspective. But um, at the same time, I feel uh, I don't I don't feel that much weight in it. I'm I'm like searching for the the, um, the weight of the work, but uh, it doesn't mean they are not talking about the social issues. But um, there there is like a difference between uh, their current way of making art. Because um, the things are more fluent, they're not even they're not just talking about like one idea. Maybe they are like blending different, um, different, different idea with different perspective. It's more like international in a way. Um, especially maybe because right now I'm in Berlin, so I would feel it's a little bit different. For example, um, the artwork in in the U.S. You know, one thing you don't get when we think about the digital is, well, for one, we have more control. We control what we put out there to people. And even today, we've chosen how our names appear on the screen and what pronouns we put behind our names and how we identify ourselves as artists or educators or whatever. Um, but something that I've missed and I think a lot of people have is the experience of seeing art in person with other people there. Mm -hmm. So as we've started to go back into museums and art galleries and public spaces where art has been commissioned, there's also always that exciting experience, and for those of us who really follow art and artists, of going to an opening and seeing what the artist looks like as a human being. This idea that, you know, people can present themselves very differently online than maybe they do in person, or there are different ramifications. What does it mean to you now as we all go back into reality and you will start exhibiting your work again and greeting your publics, I hope, at opening recessions and other events? What does it mean to be presenting your identity in a face-to-face -face way, not artwork, but just one-on-one? -on -one? How do you communicate the things we've been talking to tonight in a crowded gallery full of real people who I think are gonna be very excited to see you standing in front of your art again. How do you tell them about the sort of gender identity and ethical ethic identities that you've talked about tonight? How does that live experience impact your identity and your art making? I think it's, it's incredible and I'm always really anxious about it because I make uh, political artwork and I'm always worried that someone is going to be um, upset or, or aggressive, but I've found that the audience members are so generous and they want to connect and they want to understand. And so it actually breaks down the barriers. So when you see my name or you see the work, you might, um, you know, have one kind of impression, but when we, as two, as two <laughs> mammals, warm-blooded humans in the same room, having this conversation, it really breaks down a lot of um, the hatred and, and misconceptions and the barriers. So um, I've done uh, often performances with my works um, to put myself there, to, to show the, a face and a human being with these concepts and these you know, uh, experiences. And for me, it's always been extraordinary. I've always been grateful for all the people who, um, the, the visitors who put themselves out there, who also come and become vulnerable with me. And so I, I, I am very much looking forward to returning to that space because we are actually flesh and blood, all of us. And having this mediated space where you can be, um, uh, you know, um, uh, behaving in a particular way, as, as Gerilyn was talking about with cyberbullying and such, um, you can't, you know, it's done in different ways in person. Uh, it certainly uh, does exist, but there, there's a definitely um, a, a different space for it. And I, I think it just breaks down a lot of um, potential uh, barriers and really does bring back some kind of uh, better human com connection. Yeah, there's more opportunity for uh, dialogue. It's, it's different when you're bullying behind the screen on social media and when you're in person. I think it's important to be there in person and tell your truth, even if it's, even if it's difficult, if it's a difficult topic. It's your truth and you're, you're actually, you're not the only one, even sometimes you feel like you are. 
can other people get inspired to speak up about themselves? That's how those little changes happen, I think. I also feel it's also um, important to to show the installation of sculpture to the audience in person because I often I find a hard time to fit my installation into the the square, um, you know, on Instagram. And then um, I'm not sure that if, if anyone will actually read the text, you know. And so so it's more like a, um, people are using the Instagram to create another image of ourselves or another image of our art. And and so like by inviting the audience to actually come visit the artwork, I feel it's more about like how they perceive the artwork instead of like I'm telling, um, I'm like telling the image of my art through the, the social media, for example. So I feel like there's a quite a difference. Yeah. And uh, usually, it used to be when I would go to an opening, people would come up to me and say, oh, you're Louise Stanley. I thought you'd be taller and meaner. <laughs> I don't get the meaner. I just get the taller. I think well, Louise well, got the Well, twice, twice dear. Twice dear. <laughs> Do any of you have a question to ask of each other in our final five minutes? I want to make sure that I don't monopolize all the question asking before we wrap for the evening. I would love to experience everyone's work in person. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I know we're in different um, states and countries right now, but um, I would say if you're in a traveling show or, or something, or if you have work up, uh, you know, hopefully everyone can travel soon again. I would, I would love to know where those are so we can um, experience in person as Al's last question uh, kind of uh, yeah, guided us towards. Yeah, anybody, uh, you see my email, send me an email about your upcoming shows too. Yeah. And follow each other. Yeah. On the Instagram, as we talk about social media. <laughs> you know, if we could wrap this up in some strange full circle way I didn't expect. If there is a positive to the way social media can be used as a vehicle for change and imagery, including art be used for a vehicle for change, we can also be communicating across different barriers. You're always be changing who you are all the time and updating for the people who know you as your identity evolves and your work evolves with it. It is technically the end of our session, I believe, but I wanna thank you all um, for being here and everyone who joined us tonight. And I look forward to continuing the conversation offline. Thank yeah, you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.